Good morning. Uh, welcome back uh, to our Hebrews Hall of Faith tour. We, we took a couple weeks uh, uh, break. We were distracted by something, and uh, that's what I would call it anyway. Uh, and so we're going to dive back into Hebrews chapter 11, if you'd want to turn in your Bibles there. We are at verses 30 and 31 this morning, and we're also going to be looking at Joshua chapter 9 and chapter 2, if you want to keep that in mind. Now, at this point in our tour of the Hall of Faith, uh, we're leaving the previous section that we were in to go into a new one. We were previously in the section devoted to Moses and the story of the Exodus and the faith of the Israelites during that. And now we're, we're entering a new section of the museum, or the Hall of Faith, I guess, entitled The Judges. Now this is a section of the museum devoted to the Israelites and all their faithful acts as they conquered and settled into the land of Canaan. Now this period of history in Israel was a fulfillment of a promise that God had made back in Genesis to Abraham, to their forefather, that he would someday give them this land, the land of Canaan, that they would possess it. And so the judges were a group of individuals, a group of individual leaders that God empowered for this time period in the nation of Israel during the time of conquest. Now, don't let the word judge mislead you. Now, uh, they weren't these black-robed uh, legal authorities wearing white wigs or anything like that. Um, they did settle matters of dispute among the people from time to time, but really they were more like deliverers. They were, they were military leaders. They provided military guidance, which was greatly needed during this time of the conquest of the land of Canaan. Now, the concept of a judge within Israel really began as Moses was leading his people out of Egypt, and he had to set up a leadership system among the people. And you could probably make the argument that Moses was the first judge of Israel. And so this concept of a judge was being carried forward. And as the people were moving into the promised land, and their second attempt really, it was Joshua who had taken the mantle of leadership from Moses, who was the judge of Israel, who was its military leader. And so that's who was leading Israel as we step into the judges portion of the Hall of Faith and we look at the first exhibit found here in verses 30 and 31. Now the, the title of this exhibit is called Unconventional Faith. Unconventional Faith. And it really describes two events that happened early on in the, in the uh, period of the conquest. And we're going to read about these uh, events in verses 30 and 31 here. And in verse 30, we see an unconventional, unconventional action of faith. An unconventional action of faith taken by the Israelites in Joshua. And then the second verse is devoted to an unconventional person of faith found in the time of Judges. So let's begin in verse 30, where it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. All right, so let's see if we can develop the events that are described here in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to be going back to Joshua chapter 9 if you want to make your way there in your Bibles. And first of all, I'd like to take a look at the unconventional act of faith that we see in verse 30. In verse 30, the taking of Jericho. Now the Israelites, after stalling out in the Sinai desert for about 40 years, were finally on the cusp of taking the promised land that God was giving them. And essentially, that's what God was doing. The Israelites were there on the verge, and He's saying to them, I'm giving you this land, now go take it. This is yours, go take it. And so they had crossed the Jordan River and were massed in preparation to strike their first obstacle within the land of Canaan proper. And a few miles in front of them lay the city of Jericho. 
Now, we're probably all sort of familiar with the story if you've been in a children's Sunday school class. You've probably sung the song before, right? And when I said that, it went off in your mind, didn't it? But Jericho was their first and maybe the most significant obstacle to the possession of the land for the Israelites. See, Jericho was a very strategic city. It was basically a doorway for the Israelites to walk into the central part of the land and to begin staging their military campaigns from there. And so if you could make it through Jericho, it was like a hallway right to the center of Canaan. Now Jericho was also strategic because it was one of the major trade cities along the trade routes that went through Canaan. And so if you conquered Jericho, this was a major tactical advantage to occupying the land. But Jericho was a very daunting city. And it was known for what? Why was it such an obstacle? Big walls. That's right. That's, that's, that's from the song we sing in Sunday school class, right? Massive city walls. In fact, based on archaeological evidence, we think that Jericho at the time actually had two, two walls running parallel with each other, right next to each other. The outer wall was six feet thick, and the inner wall was 12 feet thick. And so a combined thickness of 18 feet and uh, it was thought that these walls were so sturdy uh, that the, Jericho, the people of Jericho could actually build their dwellings on top of the walls. And so in terms of Bronze Age warfare, um, a city like Jericho was, was impregnable. It, it, it seemed like an impossibility probably to the Israelites. And really Jericho was very typical of the large Canaanite cities. The Canaanites dwelled in, in, in these large areas, uh, almost like little feudal kingdoms of walled cities, each ruled by its own city king. In fact, the Israelites were intimidated by the city walls of Canaan. Nearly 40 years earlier, in their first attempt to go in the land, they had shrunk back in fear. And part of the reason they were dismayed was because of these walled cities. In Deuteronomy 1, the people of Israel complained to Moses that the cities of Canaan were fortified or walled up all the way to the heavens. And so fearfully, they stepped back from Canaan and because of their unwillingness to take the land the first time, they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. But we, what we need to see here is, is Joshua and the Israelites were, were massed in preparation to take the land, though, I want you to know this, is that the greatest obstacle that the Israelites faced was not walled cities. The greatest obstacle they faced was their lack of faith, their unbelief. See, God had told them, here's your land, go occupy it, go take it. And so they would have to trust God enough to obediently step in that direction, even though it was a fearful thing to do. They had to have a sort of faith that takes risks, despite fear. And sometimes that's the kind of faith we have to have. Now with Jericho in front of them, I'm, I'm sure that Joshua, as a brilliant military strategist, I'm sure he was thinking about all the different ways that he could take the city. They were at his disposal, according to Bronze Age warfare. I mean, he could, he could, he could lay siege to the city. And that, that, that probably was the most popular idea. In other words, surround the city with his army and basically starve them in submission. But the problem with that idea is that it took time. And with time, maybe the other city-states and Canaan would come to Jericho's rescue and drive the Israelites out. So... That might not be a good one. There were other strategies. I mean, they could build a battering ram. They, uh, they could try to scale the walls. They could dig tunnels. Um, they could build a large wooden horse. That might have been trademarked at the time. Um, and so as Joshua was, was there prepping, prepping to enter the land and to take Jericho and thinking about strategies, God basically shows up and he says... I've got a strategy, Joshua. And forget the conventional stuff. 
We're going with unconventional on this one. So turn back in Joshua chapter 6, please, uh, beginning in verse 1. What happens is, is the commander of the Lord's army pays a visit to Joshua. And this is a fierce-looking man who has a sword drawn. And we actually think that this man was a theophany. A theophany, an Old Testament visitation by God the Son. This was Christ in a pre-incarnate form, delivering a message. And why do we think that? Well, not to spend too much time on it, but, but Joshua falls to the ground and worships this man. Now, if that was an angel, the angel would have told him, get up. Okay? And, as we see in chapter 6, as this man speaks, the writer here in Scripture attributes it to the Lord, to God Himself speaking. And so here we have, in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, the unconventional battle plan of God. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord, now remember, this is the commander of the Lord speaking, said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. Now, I researched this, Sherry. Sherry, I researched this. I remember one time we talked a couple of years ago, how did the walls fall down? Well, in the Hebrew, it means they fell under themselves. They crumbled. You have a picture in your mind of them going like this. Actually, they went whew, like that. Now, now why, would, why would God use this sort of strategy? I mean, it really flies in the face of conventional tactics, right? And we have to recognize that God could use any means at His disposal to take down the city of Jericho. But I would like to suggest that God used this strategy because He was making a statement. He was delivering a message for all those who could observe what was going on. The statement of his is full of divine symbolism. Now, for example, when you look at this strategy here that the angel of the Lord outlines, what number pops out at you? Seven. It's almost like he, he ran out of ways to use the number seven in this strategy, right? He did it over and over again. Seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days, seven times. Now call me... Captain Obvious, but I think that seven is fairly significant in this strategy. Why is that? Well, I'm not a biblical numerologist, someone who puts a lot of meaning, hidden meaning into numbers. In fact, I, I would say that that's not really a great way to interpret Scripture on a, on a full-scale approach to interpreting Scripture. But the number seven is very significant symbolically with throughout scripture throughout the bible god often gives symbolic significance to mundane things to mundane items mundane concepts and subtle meanings seem to be attached to numbers at time especially the number 7 where do we see the number 7 coming into play for the first time in scripture 7 days of creation what was the 7th day it was the day of rest. That's right. That creation was complete. All was done. All the work was done. God's good mandate to create had been fulfilled. And so we see this pattern repeated with the Israelites. They were to have a Sabbath, right? A seventh day reminder. A holy day of rest because the work was complete. And so, seven at various times throughout Scripture really comes to represent divine completion and divine perfection. It's also sort of representing the holy character and the work of God. And we can also see the number seven, especially as you look into the book of Revelation and you look at the, 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 uh, the, the bowls of judgment. Um, you can see that the seven is being used to represent God's just and perfectly righteous judgment against sin. 
So seven represents the perfect and righteous work of God. And so what I think that, that what God has in mind here with his ex- extensive use of the number seven is that he's saying, it's my day of visitation. The day of the Lord has come to Canaan. This is the right time for God to bring judgment upon the people of Canaan. See, God's purpose in bringing the Israelites into the land and conquering the Canaanites really was twofold. Number one, He was giving them a land that He promised them. And number two, He was judging the wicked culture of the Canaanites. And so God was going to deal with this culture as an act of judgment because God takes sin seriously. And see, this notion bothers people, this story bothers people, and they want to accuse God of being a genocidal God because of the actions that, uh, that He took through the conquest of Canaan. But that's not true. God is not a genocidal God. And He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. But He is a God who by His very nature must judge sin. And He has a right to judge sin. And and I think that our fallen sinful nature doesn't like that idea. We want to, as Romans 1 says, we want to suppress the truth about God in our unrighteousness. It's easier to deceive ourselves about God, the truth about God, than to come to grips with the idea that He exists and that I'm accountable to Him. And that He has every right to judge me in my sin. Now we have to balance that with the idea that God doesn't delight in condemnation. In fact, God is patient. I think we talked about this several weeks ago. Out of the desire that we may turn to Him in repentance, God is a long-suffering God toward us in our sin. And He had shown immense patience with the Canaanite people. In fact, I think He probably tolerated their culture longer than any one of us would have. See, when when God made a promise to Abraham back in Genesis 15 that He was going to give Abraham this land, He also added an important detail about this. He told Abraham, essentially, I'm not going to give you that land now. I don't want to give that to you now. I don't want to judge them yet. I'm still patient toward them despite their sin. And I'm going to give them time before I remove them from their land as an act of judgment. And so, the Canaanites, what we have to realize, were given about 400 years, 400 years of opportunity to turn away from sin and turn to God. But instead of turning to God based on what knowledge they had about Him, they continued to turn away from him. They continued to suppress the truth about him more and more and plunge deeper and deeper into the darkness of sin. And they turned from God and they made for themselves and they embraced a pantheon of evil and debased false gods. And the Canaanite people became like the evil gods they worshipped. The Canaanite people were cruel. They had no sanctity of human life. They sacrificed their children to gods in incredibly sadistic ways. They they practiced sexually immoral worship rites. In fact, uh, some of the archaeological, archaeological evidence that has been dug up as far as Canaanite literature at the time is R rated at best. And so by the time Joshua and the Israelites showed up hundreds of years after the promise to Abraham, they were standing on the threshold of one of the most dark and polluted cultures that the history of the world has ever known. And see, God was saying the time is right. It's time to act in judgment. God is long-suffering, but His patience against sin does come to an end. And it's not so much that He loses His capacity to be patient... It's not like that runs out. But it's because there's a point in which unchecked sin becomes overly destructive. And God has to intervene. You know, 
There's a point in sinful cultures, and you kind of have to wonder, you know, where we're at in this process, where that polluted culture becomes like gangrene. And its infection is too terrible to spread, and so God has to remove it. You know, sin is like a virus that has corrupted God's good work. And it has an insatiable desire to spread and to corrupt and to darken and to pollute. And it's never satisfied with the territory it already has. It wants more and more. It wants to gain more ground. It always wants more. And it must always be held in check. And so as the Israelites were massed in preparation to enter the promised land, God was using them to hold a sinful culture in check. It was time for judgment. And so Joshua and his army demonstrated a complete trust in this unconventional battle plan. In fact, as you read through the account here, you don't, you don't hear any indication of anybody going, wait a second, <laughs> what? March around seven times? What? That's not how you take a city. No. In fact, it seems like every Israelite in the army was sold on this idea. What a great example of a combined and collective act of faith on the part of the people of God. And so they did as God requested. And as the song goes, the walls came a what? Came a tumbling down, right? And the Israelites, as an act of God's judgment, completely destroyed the city of Jericho, including every living thing. And that's just a sobering reminder that sin is something that God does take seriously. Well, not everyone in the city of Jericho perished. Because there was one unconventional person of faith and her family that escaped this judgment of God. Of course, as we saw in Hebrews 11, this was Rahab the prostitute. See, Rahab is a real and conventional figure when it comes to the people of faith in the Bible. She doesn't, she doesn't fit the external mold that we tend to put on people of faith, right? First of all, she was a prostitute. Possibly she was performing this role within the debased sexual worship rites of their culture. Secondly, she was a Canaanite. And as I said before, this was a dark culture and she was in the middle of that darkness. And thirdly, by nature of being a Canaanite, she was a Gentile. She was outside the people of Israel. She had not been under the leadership of Moses. She had not received the law or responded to the law that was given to Moses and the people of Israel. She had not participated in the worship life of Israel. She was an outsider, lacking the knowledge of God that a typical Israelite would have. So how did this person come to faith? She looked like an unlikely candidate. But you know, the Bible is very clear that no one can claim ignorance when it comes to the existence of God. No one can claim ignorance when it comes to the existence of God. And that is true whether you're a Canaanite or whether you're an Israelite, whether you're American or whatever nationality you have. And God's grace has always been wider than the people of Israel. See, God speaks to every one of us through the law that He's written on every human heart. God preaches a sermon of His existence through His created order. And Rahab, like everyone else who ever existed, could listen to these natural revelations from God. And she heard some news also about the God of the Israelites, a little bit of information, as Israel was making its way into the Promised Land. And while everyone else in Jericho was suppressing the truth about God and their unrighteousness, Rahab responded to what little she knew about God in faith. Now back sometime before the Israelites had crossed the Jordan River and into Canaan, Joshua and his people were massed there beside the river. 
And they were making preparations to go in to the promised land. And one of the things that that Joshua did was he sent in two spies secretly. We think he did it secretly because, of course, he didn't want the Canaanites to know. And he didn't want his people to know he sent the spies in because what if they came back again with a bad report? And so he sent these spies in to Canaan. They probably uh, swam across the Jordan River in the middle of the night. And they um, stealthily made their way to Jericho, probably a distance of about five miles or so from the Jordan River. And they made their way into the city gates of Jericho. Now, they found a perfect place while they were there to lay low and assess the situation. It happened to be Rahab, the prostitute's house. Her house was against the wall of the city. And it was a kind of a perfect place to have an exit if you needed it to. You could, you could go out behind the house and go over the city walls if you had to make a quick escape. And it's a place where probably that men came and went without questions asked. And so this was a place where they could set up their base of operations. Well, turns out the spies weren't as subtle as they planned on being. And maybe after 40 years of wandering in the desert, their spying skills were a bit rusty. Because the people of Jericho were onto them. Maybe they noticed two sort of mysterious men making their way into the city. Who knows? But the people of Jericho were very paranoid at this point. They knew that the Israelites were coming. They even knew that the God of the Israelites had brought the people out of Egypt in an amazing display of power. And so they were on edge. They were worried. And they, of course, weren't unsettled enough to turn to God in repentance, but... They were shaken. And so news of the spies reaches the king of Jericho. And he sent some of his men to to go inspect Rahab's house. See if this was true. Look into the situation. And when the men showed up at Rahab's door, she had already hidden the spies on the roof of her house. And she lied to the men, the king's men, who came there about the spies and sent them on the way, saying, "I I think the spies may have gone out the gate. Now, I'm not going to spend time on Rahab's lie and the ethical dilemma that that creates. That's a sermon for another time. But then she made the Israelite spies promise to show mercy to her and to her family when Israel attacked Jericho and afterwards she helped them escape. Now, if you would please turn back to chapter 2 in Joshua. We're going to take a look at this interaction between Rahab and the spies. But I want us to know something going into this. That Rahab's actions weren't entirely out of a sense of self-preservation, okay? She wasn't just trying to do this to save her own skin. Her actions were a response of faith in the true God. In James chapter 2, James talks about Rahab and he says, Rahab the prostitute was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. In other words, her interaction here with the Israelite spies, in this interaction, Rahab had demonstrated a justifying or saving kind of faith in God. So let's look at chapter 2. Let's uh, pick up in verse 8 here. Before the men lay down, she came up to them, and this is the spies, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house, and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. 
And so Rahab, as she assisted the spies, confessed and demonstrated a legitimate faith in the true and living God. She confessed her faith, saying to the Israelite spies, The Lord your God, He is the God. He is the God in heaven above and on the earth belief. She acknowledged God for who He was. And then she acted in faith, proving her faith by her works, risking her life even to help God's people. And also notice, I think this is kind of a subtle teaching here, she immediately becomes an evangelist of sorts by rescuing her family from the judgment to come. So let's keep reading here in chapter 2. It says, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go on your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with, with you in your house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you've made us swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And so sometime later, as... Joshua and the army encircled Jericho, and the walls came down, and the Israelites destroyed Jericho in an act of judgment. The Israelite soldiers spared the people in a house that was marked by a red cord hanging from the window. And so Rahab, this unconventional person of faith, and her family were allowed to live. But you know one of the coolest things about Rahab's story wasn't what happened at that time in the land of Canaan. It's how her story kept being told and how it was passed down. Because you know what? Rahab wasn't just some outsider who was spared. She was that. But she was also a person that was given a very special honor. God chose this unconventional woman of faith as his means to work out another Abrahamic promise. Isn't it just like God to do things in ways that we don't expect? You think you've got them figured out? It's almost like, well, too bad. I'm going to do it a different way. Well, anyway, God had promised Abraham that Abraham would one day have a descendant that would become the blessing to all the nations of the world. And so after Jericho fell, Rahab was actually a way that God fulfilled this promise because Rahab assimilated into the people of Israel. She married an Israeli man and she gave birth to a man named Boaz, a familiar biblical figure. Boaz married Ruth. And Ruth, as it turns out, was the great-great-grandmother of King David. And out of King David's royal line, one day would come the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so wherever the genealogy of our Lord is celebrated, Rahab's name is going to be mentioned. Our Lord had an unlikely grandmother of faith in his family line. And so Rahab was spared because a red cord had marked her window. All around her in the city of Jericho, the judgment of God was falling on the people of Jericho. And here we have a person spared because they were marked by red. Did anybody see the symbolism in that? It's hard to ignore. You know, from the red cord hanging from Rahab's window, we could look back into the Exodus as Moses was leading the people out of Israel 
back to the time where the firstborns of Israel were spared by red, hanging from door frames. The red of the innocent blood of a lamb. And from Jericho, where we see this red cord, we could look forward to a time in which our Lord was nailed to a cross with rivers of His precious red blood flowing down. And for those who believe it, His blood, like the crimson cord in the story of Rahab, marks us for the mercy of God. His blood was poured out on that cross for your sin and my sin so that God can pardon those who believe. Have you done that? Have you placed your trust in the precious blood of Christ? Have you placed your faith in His only Son? If you haven't done that, I invite you to do that this morning. Um, After the time that we have our benediction and closing, there will be someone up here by this front pew, board member, that can pray with you and talk about that decision with you. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the example of the Israelites and their willingness to step out in faith despite fear. Help us to be that kind of people marked by a faithful commitment to do your will. Father, we thank you for Rahab. We thank you for the mercy that was shown to her by faith. Help us, Father, to celebrate the mercy you've shown us. And help us to offer that mercy to those who need it. And we pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.